what is the world going to look like in another five years, another 10 years? I have a two and a half year old daughter. When she's an adult, what is this world going to look like? Because it's, we've literally just taken rational thought and literally thrown it out the window. We're living in a society that's a free for all, legitimately a free for all. You, whatever it is you feel you are, like, what? So where's the line? This is a recipe for chaos. This is a recipe for anarchy. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Tattoo Preacher Podcast. This is episode number seven. Hope everyone is doing awesome today. Now, in this podcast, man, we're going to be looking at another another relevant topic that is taking our culture by storm. And it's one that, again, I have stayed away from but i was confronted with it in a pretty profound way over the last couple weeks and so now i just i can't help it i got to talk about it and it's the subject of gender identity Uh, i know again this it's a huge topic it's and it's trending it's it's everywhere and i've heard some stories and some reports that have literally it literally has rocked me to the point where i'm like okay i gotta i gotta say my piece in this so we're going to talk about that a bit and then i want to transition that use that as a segue into talking about another i guess cultural movement that is affecting the church and christianity and it is this whole progressive Christianity thing, which is is gone everywhere. And I think there's a connection here that I want to point out. And because if we're not careful, if the church is not careful, this whole gender stuff, as we're going to get into, it's already making its way into the church. That's why, that's why I'm talking about it. That's why it's important to talk about because the reality is a lot of Christians, a lot of churches even, they're not addressing this stuff. That's where we're going today. I'm going to talk about those two things. And again, I want to say from the top, it's, it's, I'm not going to be slandering or condemning or being mean. This is not, this is not about that. This is a, I'm just going to be talking about the facts that I've seen, that I've learned. I'm going to be reading some stuff. Because I think it's important to talk about I'm not going to be slandering anybody, not going to be calling people out or anything like that. But there's just some stuff that's got to be said. And so that's where we're going. And so, again, before we get there, though, I just want to mention, if you haven't already, follow me on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube at The Tattooed Preacher. That helped me out. And thanks for all the engagement and support and encouragement and the messages and the emails and all that kind of stuff. You guys are awesome. Those of you that have chosen to follow my social media content, it still blows me away when I think about it. So thank you. And also, if you don't mind, just leave a little, a little good five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you get anything from these podcasts, again, that will help me out a lot. Here we go. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Okay, I guess I'll start by telling a story. The story that literally has rocked me to my core. And it happened last week, 10 days ago now, where I came across a TikTok video and i've seen tons of videos come up on tiktok and instagram over the last year and a half that i've really been hardcore into social media but this one was just different like it 
it affected me enough to the point where I've been thinking about this and trying to process it and research it and really look into it more and more. And I, th- I, I, I shared it, I think, in the last episode briefly. But I want to just go a bit more in depth into it because it sets the stage for where we're going to go. came across this video. And it was this man who was married, who had kids, and then decided that what on the inside, what he felt was a six-year-old girl. And so he divorced his wife, left his kids, and... I don't, and I don't know how this works. Like, I don't get how this works, but he then somehow, and again, I don't know how he works or I don't know the logistics. I just know the story that I saw in his interview because it didn't get into everything. But then he began to dress and change his body and look like a little girl, but he's a, was a pretty big, bigger sized man. He got adopted into a family. This older couple took him in to be their little girl. I just, I, and then the grandparents who adopted him would bring their grandkids over to play with their new little girl. And so you have this man dressed as a little girl playing six-year-old little girl games. And living out this bizarre and mind-blowing fantasy. I, I don't know what else you call it. And I was watching this and I just like had to watch it a few times because I couldn't just, I didn't get it. And it's one thing to have mental issues. This guy clearly has got some stuff that he, I don't know what happened to him but he clearly is dealing with something and it's it ha- this is what I, i'm hoping that it is and so he's whatever chose to act this way it, it's one thing to act out of a place of hurt and trauma and pain and whatever that's one thing but it's the fact that people were enabling it that these grandparents adopted him Like he was married with kids and had a job. He's not like he was someone who was living by himself. He was alone. Like this guy was a normal dude. And they fed into this thing. And the term is called trans age, where it's this identity where adults can identify as different ages. You can identify as as an age that you're actually biologically not at the moment. And it just, it's, it shook me. Like I'm even right now, I'm, 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 I struggle to process this because where, where do you draw the line here? Let's think about the implications because this is not an isolated case. This is becoming a thing where it's now like where if you speak against this, you're not the normal one. The, the normal one is the someone who identifies as this man identifying as a six year old girl that like we're we're living in a culture where that is more normal than someone to look at that situation and say that's weird, and seeing culture shift this way and seeing this become a thing, it's just like I know that the world has is going in some pretty dark ways. And I know that there's things happening in our world that if we, if people actually knew the kind of things that were happening in our world, people wouldn't believe it. And so I get it. There's evil happening. The culture is becoming more and more secular. It's becoming more and more like anti-God. And I get that's been happening, but it's like this, this one incident, just, I don't know what it was, but it just, punch me in the face with this reality and it's 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 just setting the stage for complete craziness and chaos because where do you draw the line where do you draw the line with this if 
an adult can choose to identify as a kid, then can a kid choose to identify as an adult? Like, how do you say no to that? Like, why can't an eight-year-old boy decide that he, on the inside, he's actually a 50-year-old woman? Can he then do that? Can he then go to the, I don't know, the DMV, the license place, and get a license? Because he identifies as a 50-year-old, and apparently that's fine. That's accepted as normal in our culture. Is that possible? Can 15-year-olds identify as 19 or 20 or 21 and then go out? And if the drinking age is 19, can they identify as 20 so they can go drink? It's just like, where, where do you draw the line with this stuff? And then if you look at the massive issue in our culture of pedophilia, and that's a whole other, that's a whole other beast in and of itself where you're having people push for the fact that's an actual attraction. It's going to become an act, like the fact that you could have these adult men identify as little kids and just give them access to little children. It's, this is a playground for pedophiles. This is a playground for people that are sick. And it's considered normal. I just, like, where do we draw the line with this? And so this, this is where my mind has been going for, I don't know, two weeks now, week and a half now, nonstop. And so then I, it pushed me to do a bit of research more into gender identity. And again, there's a point to all of this, and I'm going to connect this because there's a lot of the stuff that I didn't know. So I assume if I didn't know, there could be lots of people out there who also don't really know some of this stuff. And so I just started doing just some research here on different, different gender identities or just different identities. And so the first one was trans age, which again, set me down this road. And then there's, I didn't find the exact term. So I just called it trans animal. And this is where people identify as animals. And so there was a popular documentary that kind of that came out a few months ago called What is a Woman? And in that documentary, the, the main dude, Matt Walsh, he interviewed this person who identified as a wolf. And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole movement of people who are identifying as different animals. So I was just like, what? How? And, and I just don't understand how that's considered normal. I, I don't get it. People identifying as animals, legitimately thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm a cow on the inside. I, I, I feel like a cow, so I'm going to identify as a cow. And we're just supposed to accept it. Like I, I, so that's trans animal. Then there's one that I recently just discovered. As in, I'm recording this February 1st, January 31st, I discovered this one. I didn't know this one existed. Tran, transable. Do you know what transable is? This is people who feel like they should have been born disabled. And there, I heard two, two reports. There was a man who cut off his arm because he thought that he should have have been born an amputee. What? He cut off his arm. A grown man cut off his arm because on the inside he felt like he should have been born an amputee. There was a woman who poured drain cleaner in both of her eyes because she wanted to identify as blind. What? The crap is that not only is that a a mockery of people who are actually disabled who actually have to suffer with that and deal with that who to have then people decide that that's an identity or a reality to be identified with to where you're pouring drain drain cleaner on your face so that you can make yourself blind. 
to cut off a a limb. It's like what what's happening? Like what and it's accepted as normal. 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 It should it's it should just be accepted. What? It's how, how did we how do we get here? So that's transable. Then there's the the common term, right? Transgender. And this is the one where a person who lives as a member of a gender that's different than the one that they were assigned at birth. And so this is one, this is, I guess you could call it the main one, the most common one, transgender. So then you have a transgender man, transgender woman. So you have a man who feels like they should have been a woman. So then they identify as a woman, woman who felt like they should be a man. So they identify as a man. Then you have, and then here's a few that I didn't really know. You have a gender, not having a gender or identifying with a gender. So this is people who also describe themselves as being gender neutral or genderless. They don't have a gender. They're not male or female. You're you're neither. So you're a gender. Okay. Then there's bi gender, a person who fluctuates between traditionally male and female gender based behaviors and identities. So you fluctuate between both. So you're, I guess you wake up one day and you feel like a male and then the next day you feel like a, fem- a female and you do both. Then there's one that was called third gender, a term for a person who does not identify with either a man or a woman, but identifies with another gender. This gender category is used by societies that recognize three or more genders both contemporary and historical, and is also a conceptual term meaning different things to different people who use it. Yeah, that this, I don't even know. I don't even know what to do with that one. So you're not a man or a woman, but you're another one. And that other one is different depending on who you are, where you live, what the cultural meanings are from wherever you live. That's okay, third gender. And there's gender fluid. A person who is gender fluid may always feel like a mix of the two traditional genders, but may feel more man some days or more woman than others. Again, you are just you morph into male or female depending on what you feel that day. And then there's one I saw called two spirit. This is an umbrella term traditionally used by Native American people to recognize individuals who possess qualities of both genders. Cool. And again, there's more than you have non-binary. And again, my point is this is, first of all, I didn't even know what a lot of these were. But this is, these are real life realities right now. That This is accepted. This is considered normal now. Normal. And it's my question that I'm trying to process, that I'm trying, that, that I would ask people who are in the camps that think this is fine. My question is, where do we draw the line? Where does it stop? If this continues to go and evolve and progress, what is the world going to look like in another five years, another 10 years. I have a two and a half year old daughter. When she's an adult, what is this world going to look like? Because it's, we've literally just taken rational thought and literally thrown it out the window. And it's, we're living in a society that's a free for all, legitimately a free for all. You, whatever it is you feel you are, like, what? So where's the line? This is a recipe for chaos. This is a recipe for anarchy, where there is no more lines. The, the lines have been blurred. The, I don't know, I, I just, I don't know as a society, if we continue down this road, how we can sus- sustain ourselves, like how how things are not just going to cave 
and collapse because there's no more there's no more subjective or objective reality anymore everything is subjective everything is everything changes from person to person everyone's feelings are different so i feel this you feel this and i have my feelings you have your feelings they have their feelings and what i i just and we see this right here like this these are legitimate real life things happening and this is just one segment of our society this isn't there's there's so many other layers and levels to this i just picked this one because it's the one that has been affecting me recently and it's the one i've come across and but i look at this and i look at these people who are falling into these into these categories these people that are clearly hurting clearly broken clearly wounded clearly clearly have mental issues going on you can't tell me that someone cutting off body body parts cutting off limbs is normal putting toxic poisonous drain cleaner on your eyes to make yourself blind you can't tell me that's normal you can't tell me that a 31 year old man who wants to live as a toddler and has reconfigured his whole house created a a, a crib for himself sits in his own man-made high chair drinks from a bottle wears diapers and does this voluntarily because he likes it you can't tell me that's normal and we're just supposed to sit back and be like that's what the, that's how they identify to each their own that's fu- what what where's the line where is the line is my question I want to segue into another topic that I think is in the Christian world and the church world is becoming more and more connected. Now, when we live in a culture, again, that has no more lines or the lines of rational thought and reality are becoming more and more blurred where truth is subjective and where that is the air that we breathe now in that kind of culture it makes perfect sense to me that a movement would come to the surface and gain popularity like progressive christianity has and it's been the last one or one or two years where this quote unquote Christian movement has made its is making its rounds in and through the churches here at least in North America. Now the reason why I'm talking about progressive Christianity and what we just talked about with gender identity because one of the key components to progressive Christianity is the term or the subject of inclusiveness when you talk to leaders and or when you hear leaders in in the progressive churches when you hear them speak i've seen tons of interviews and listen to their some of their sermons and you'll hear over and over this idea of inclusivity which makes perfect sense this desire to be welcoming of everybody. Come as you are. You be you, which fits right into what we've just been talking about. People identifying as whatever they want, where no matter what you feel, that's what you are. Take that approach and put it into religious context and you get progressive Christianity. And so this is why this this is a, an extremely dangerous and unbiblical movement. And what makes them so dangerous is because they they use so much of the same terminology, same words, same names, 
the the title of their their movement is progressive christianity so for those of you who don't know exactly what it is i'm going to read you some stuff here and then we'll chat about it so progressive christianity is a modern theological movement that emphasizes a personal and contemporary interpretation of the Christian faith. It emphasizes social justice, equality, and the rejection of traditional dogmas and biblical literalism. Progressive Christians prioritize the teachings of Jesus, such as love, compassion, and service to others, over strict adherence to religious doctrine. This approach is inclusive, and often appeals to those who seek a more open and accepting interpretation of Christianity. Now, did you see what's going on? It emphasizes social justice and equality. It prioritizes teachings of Jesus, such as love, compassion, and service to others. This approach is inclusive and often appeals to those who seek a more accepting interpretation of Christianity. There's a rejection of traditional dogma and biblical literalism and religious doctrine. That is being pushed away, pushed to the side, and this this inclusive Jesus who's about love and compassion has taken the forefront. Now, what's interesting is the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and he warns them. He's warning them about teachers who are preaching a false Jesus and a false gospel and a false Holy Spirit. This is exactly what progressive Christianity is. They're using the name Jesus. They're using the Bible. They're, they use teachings. They're about love and compassion and inclusivity. So on the surface, it sounds like it's legit. It sounds like it's, it's too good to be true. It's a message that says, you know what? Our heart is inclusivity. We want everyone to be welcome. The days of religious doctrine and dogma, the way things have been, are now over. Now is the time of love and acceptance, and you can come as you are, you be as you feel, and you will be welcomed and accepted and loved by God. So they're creating a system that allows them to do whatever they want, be whoever they want, and still claim followership to God. They've fashioned and created a Jesus that is okay with sin. And so by them, in this definition that we read, this this strict adherence to religious doctrine, what's religious doctrine? This is talking about sin salvation, sanctification, the entire gospel message, this is what they're throwing out of the window so that to make room for their own newfound system and beliefs of inclusivity and acceptance. And this is what they're doing. This is why this is dangerous. Progressive Christians believe that reinterpreting traditional teachings and beliefs can help to create a more inclusive and just faith. By reinterpreting traditional teachings, progressive Christians can challenge the ways in which they have been used to justify oppression and exclusion and can create a faith that is more in line with Jesus' message of love and compassion. So again, reinterpreting traditional teachings, challenging the ways that have always been teachings that have always existed. And again, this isn't this is the teaching that is, is the foundational core doctrines and beliefs that the Christian faith has been built upon. The cross. Salvation by grace through faith in who Jesus is and what he's done. The fact that 
we were all born sinners who needed to be saved. The fact that there's sinful nature, the fact that there is such a thing as right and wrong, the fact that marriage is between a man and a woman, beliefs and teachings and doctrine that has that's that that the Christian faith has been founded upon and established for thousands of years is literally being removed, thrown out in place of this newfound teaching that is inclusive to anyone and everyone, no matter what. It's dangerous. And so when you're looking at the church and you're looking at a movement like this, do you not see how this connects with what we've already talked about? So then these people who identify as animals, for example, or these trans age people who adults identifying as little kids can just show up to a church like this and according to their own theology, we want to create an inclusive environment where everyone is welcome and accept it as they are. Do you not see how that is connected now? Creating a space for that, creating a church for that, creating a religious system for that. This is dangerous. And they're doing it in the name of God. They're doing it using the Bible. They're doing it by twisting and perverting and changing and adding to or deleting the sacred text of Scripture so that they can make space for people to come and be welcomed and accepted no matter what. This is where it's going because without any lines, without any boundaries, it's going to be a free-for-all. Like Anarchy is coming at this rate. And in the religious world, in the church world, this is what's coming. Progressive Christians also argue that traditional teachings and beliefs have been used to exclude people who don't fit the traditional mold. For example, the traditional, check this out, the traditional teaching of the born again experience has been used to exclude people who don't have a dramatic conversion experience. And the traditional teaching of eternal punishment has been used to exclude those who don't accept a certain understanding of the afterlife. Do you see what is happening? The doctrine of salvation, where we need to be born again, is called into question, if not downright removed. Talking about hell, eternal punishment, is something that excludes certain people who don't have a certain belief in that. Let's just remove it. Let's create a theology, let's create a system of belief where anybody can have their own opinion on whatever it is that they want, and that's the truth. So there's no such thing as heaven or hell, right or wrong. It's We're just going to create a space of inclusivity and love and where people who don't fit the traditional mold can come and be welcome. And what's happening and will continue to get worse, in my opinion, is people who then speak out against this. What are they called? They're called bigots. People who just hate and judge and condemn. People who speak out against this, they're the ones that are weird. They're the problem. So in my entire podcast today, I'm part, according to this system of thinking, I'm part of the problem. Here's an example from someone who went into or accepted progressive Christian theology. This is what they said. I find progressive Christian theology resonates with me in a very, or sorry, I, I find progressive Christian theology resonates with me in a way that traditional theology never did. For example, understanding God as a dynamic and evolving being allows me to see God as present and in all creation, not just in a distant heaven. And viewing Jesus as a liberator and advocate for the oppressed helps me to see the ways in which my faith calls me to work for social justice and equality. Do you see how this is just, how 
It's been twisted. They've literally created a Jesus. Mold, they've fashioned and molded a Jesus that is completely okay with everything that the text says he's not okay with. But that doesn't fit their narrative. So they have to create a new Jesus. Jesus that's inclusive to the whims and desires and feelings of a given person. A, a God that's dynamic and evolving. An evolving God. Pretty sure... The Bible says God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's not evolving. But this is what they have to believe. This is the deception here. They have to create a God that has to evolve because they know deep down what the text says, but they can't fit their narrative with the text, so they have to change it. And so, they have to, so they have to create it an evolving God. Progressive Christians also believe that in reinterpreting traditional teachings and beliefs is necessary in order to keep the faith relevant in today's world. As society and culture changes, traditional teachings and beliefs may become less relevant or useful, and reinterpreting them can help to make the faith more meaningful and applicable to people's lives. Reinterpreting traditional teachings and beliefs is necessary to be relevant. You have to reinterpret what the Bible says to fit this entire new narrative that our culture, this Antichrist culture, is pushing for. Like we're living in an upside down world. And I'd say progressive Christianity is an upside down. It's, I'd say progressive Christianity is a direct byproduct of this upside down culture that we're living in. And it's dangerous, man. It's dangerous. Because it's a message that that tickles people's ears. It's a message that says you can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want. It does not matter. You're welcome as you are. There's that's it. So you have people who are like, oh, I can have my cake and eat it too. I can believe this God over here who's where this lifestyle is not a sin. I can do that and still make it to heaven. I can participate in these behaviors and that were considered wrong, but now I can do them over here and have it be considered right. It's an upside down world. It's an upside down theology. And it's very dangerous. And so again, to me, I don't want to belabor the point, but when you live in a culture that has no more boundaries, no more lines, when people can identify and be whoever they want, be whoever they feel, rational thought is thrown out the window where you can have a, a theology that's basically a, a, a man-made theology that's just been mushed together to be welcoming and accepting of any kind of lifestyle. It, it's very dangerous. And so my encouragement in saying all of this, I just, this, I don't, I guess I want this podcast just to, to cause you to think, to cause you to become aware of what's going on. Take a look at our culture and, and our society and, see this is where people are at this is where things are going and ask ourselves as christians as the church like what are we supposed to do here what's our play how do we show jesus how do we be jesus the real jesus in this situation how do we keep from becoming contaminated and deceived how do we speak the truth in love jesus our uh, John writes in, in John chapter 1 that Jesus came in grace and truth. What does grace and truth look like in our culture? And I think before we can really answer that question, we have to really know what's going on in our culture. We have to see where people are at. We have to see 
what's being accepted and lived out and practiced as normal? The answer, see, the answer to the whole gender situation, and that's just one example, that's one slice of the pie. But the answer to that is not progressive Christianity. The answer has to be the Jesus of the Bible. <laughs> like, we are, as Christians, supposed to be the light of the world. So we have to figure out a way to preach truth in love in such a way that is going to impact our culture. Because right now, progressive Christianity, they're they're taking in all those people by the thousands and we're not doing a good job. And so I just, I hope that this just, this podcast I, I, helps you think, helps you process, helps you, helps to give you some things to pray about because this is what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about what is the, what is the job of a Christian here? And it's not to be silent and say nothing, do nothing, pretend like it's going to go away because it's not going to go away. And I don't know about many churches who are addressing it, who are proactively addressing it. I've seen a lot of churches who are caving, who are buying into this progressive theology because it's popular, it's easier. I don't know. I guess I hope that this just helps you think and you can bring these things to the Lord and ask Him to give you wisdom and discernment and understanding about how to reach people for Jesus in this culture. Yeah, that is episode seven. This is a tough one. It's a tough one. It's, you know, I don't know if this made sense at all. I just, I feel like there's just so much stuff that is so deep and it's very unsettling and it's confusing and it's heartbreaking and it's angering and it's just, it's all of the above. And I'll probably end up doing a lot more episodes on this kind of thing because this is, I'm just beginning the process. I'm beginning the process of processing all of this because it's important. We got to talk about it. And um, so, yeah, I, I hope you, y'all got something from this. I hope you learned something. Hope that it just provoked you a bit to, to do your own research and to, and to do your own study and to bring this before the Lord to see what he would have you do. That's episode seven. Thanks so much for listening, for watching. Have an awesome rest of your day or evening whenever you are listening to this or watching this. And I'll see you all in the next episode. Much love. God bless.